Okay, so here we are. This is episode three then of these online art history talks. And uh, today we are going to travel to Madrid uh, to look at the work of this fabulous painter, uh, Diego Velasquez. And we can see him here. So you can see the pointing device that I'm using. Look out for the little red dot. So we are going to be looking at the, some of the earlier paintings that this man painted. And he spent his, almost his entire career as a court painter in Madrid. So he was uh, working for King Philip IV um, for his entire career. And what that means is that very few people knew about him. It was only really when uh, the wonderful museum, the Prado, opened uh, that his work began to be appreciated. Because before then, uh, the majority of the paintings were uh, in uh, the royal palace of Madrid, and no one really knew them apart from people who worked there or the royal family themselves. So let's look. The next image that I'll show you is the best painting in Scotland, and it's done by an 18-year-old. Look at this. This painting is called The Old Lady Frying Eggs, when in fact to me it looks like she's poaching them. You can see, you can get a little close-up of this, it's quite brilliantly done, but imagine that this is an 18-year-old, so quite often on tour, I get shown people's sketchbooks and I think, oh, that's really great, fantastic. But imagine if I was shown something like this. Um, the incredible way that all the different objects are painted shows an amazing level of technical skill that it's almost impossible to believe that this is the work of an 18-year-old. Um, and to be clear about this, though, he is living in the 17th century, so he is almost a direct um, contemporary of Rembrandt, who's the wonderful Dutch painter. Uh, they're born almost at the same time, and both of them are clearly under the influence of the great Italian artist. Actually, in a couple of talks' time. But for um, for Velasquez, though, he is uh, he is he's brought up and born in Seville, which is down in the south of the country. And uh, he ends up actually uh, being taught art from quite a young age. And it doesn't take long before people uh, have noticed what he's doing. And this is an example. So this painting uh, dates from the time when he actually lived and worked in Seville. Um, if we move forward to a picture which is from the following year, this is called the water cellar and this painting is actually in london it's in the water loo gallery of apsley house which is which is a privately owned by the duke of wellington although i think it's the national trust owned the gallery and the reason why this painting is in london is because it was in the spanish royal collection but in 1813 uh, towards the end of the napoleonic wars uh, Napoleon's elder brother, Joseph Bonaparte, was the de facto ruler of Spain for a while. And he uh, took loads of paintings. He fled the palace, basically, taking many pictures with him. And uh, the Duke of Wellington essentially relieved him of these paintings and uh, offered to give them back. And the response from the next Spanish monarch is, uh, keep the paintings, but uh, just get rid of the French for us. So uh, we can see here this amazing painting. He's 19 years old when he does this. And the little detail here is the glass of water itself. Um, those are figs inside the glass. And apparently that's still common today in Seville. You have a glass of water and it's um, possibly flavored uh, with the taste of figs. So an extraordinary uh, picture. So if any of you planning on going to London, hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, this is a gallery that you perhaps would not think of going to, uh, but highly recommended. So everyone, what we're going to do then is move 
um, swiftly through his life. And we'll look at a couple of other famous pictures before we get to uh, Las Meninas itself. So let's, let's take a look. So he goes to Italy a couple of times. Um, and on the second uh, visit to Italy um, in 1650, uh, he travels with um, this chap here, who's actually his slave. And this man is called Juan de Parea. Um, and even though he's a slave, uh, which sounds bizarre today, he is actually quite devoted to Velasquez and they get on together very well. And one of the reasons for that is because Perea is not a bad painter himself. And um, when this picture is painted, it's first of all exhibited outside the Pantheon in Rome, for those of you that know the Pantheon. And there's an exhibition on uh, various different artists. And Velasquez is actually in uh, Rome and he's painting a portrait. He's about to paint a portrait of the Pope. Um, but this painting of, of the slave uh, is amazing to people because apparently it's a very close likeness uh, of the man himself. And so Velasquez, when he finished the painting, he sent uh, Juan de Perea with this painting on a kind of walking tour through the streets of Rome. And apparently the locals were just astonished that an inanimate object could look exactly like the person holding it. Um, this painting today is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in New York and would be one of the greatest paintings in the United States, I think. So again, when you get the chance in the future, make an effort to go to the Met um, and go and see this wonderful painting. You can see the, the uh, realism and the humanity and the, and the honesty in this face. It's quite brilliantly painted. This is the famous portrait of the Pope. Everyone, this is Innocent X. He comes from the Pamphili family. And today the portrait hangs in the Pamphili gallery, which is on Via del Corso in Rome. Um, it is, uh, it has its own room, in fact, this picture. And it is, it is a brilliant painting. And people were also terrified by this. Because if we look at the Pope's face, he is, a really scary looking guy and his hands look like he's about to clench or hit somebody. So he, he, the Pope himself personally loved the painting, but it was astonishing to people in Rome that anybody could paint uh, with this amazing degree of realism. Uh, the British artist uh, Francis Bacon was uh, completely haunted by this painting and painted dozens of images of it uh, which is worth investigation for some of you later. Maybe you look online at um, images of the Pope by Francis Bacon. He was, uh, there are loads of them. It's well worth investigation. But anyway, this great picture uh, by, by Velasquez is in Rome uh, and the name of the Pope is Innocent X. All right, so here it is then. This is what, we, this is what we're here to talk about. This amazing painting called Las Meninas which translates as the, as the maids. But then they're a bit more than maids, actually, these two. They're, I suppose, as a British, uh, an English translation um, would be ladies in waiting for the, uh, for the royal courts of the United Kingdom. Um, and this painting uh, was done towards the end of his career. So it's actually from, six, uh, from 1656. Although some art historians think it might be 1659, but I'll get onto that later. The painting, first of all, is huge. So it's 10 feet tall and about nine foot across um, and is a little darker than what we see here. In fact, this is a, but the picture is beautifully lit up from the light source over on the right hand side that you can see. And what we're looking at here, right in the middle, is the princess, so she's a five-year-old girl, Princess Margarita. And she is surrounded, we, we know the names of all the people in this painting. So let's go through the names first, so you know who it is that you're looking at. Well, here he is, the great painter himself, 
This is Diego Velasquez. And painted on his chest there is a red cross. That's the Order of Santiago, which is like a, an order of nobility that he strived for for many years and got towards the end of his life. Um, so we have a, a lady here, and she's offering a cup of water to the princess. Uh, her name is uh, Maria Agustina Sarmiento. And she is curtsy, and you can see she's making a curtsying gesture towards the princess. Um, and not, the lady on the other side doing the curtsy, that's Isabel de Viasco. And she is aware, of course, of our movement, because all of these people are reacting to us. We're the viewer in their painting. And that's why the picture is so fascinating to people, because all of these people are staring at you, staring at us. Uh, we have the dwarf here, Maria Barbola, and she's wearing a beautiful dress, uh, which is painted with lapis lazuli, which is a very expensive blue color. And um, we see this little boy here, Nicholas Bautisato, he's standing uh, on the top of the dog there. That's a mastiff, I think, descended from dogs that, uh, in fact, James I gave to the Spanish court generations ago. We have uh, the princess's governess here. This is Maria de Uloa. And there's a bodyguard here whose name is Diego Ruiz Ascona. And in the background, here on the doorway, and he's the focal point. He's the vanishing point of this painting. Look at these different pyramid triangle shapes caused by Jose Nieto de Velasquez, maybe a cousin of the painter, but there's no evidence to suggest he was. But he was the chamberlain for the queen. Now look, this is a mirror hanging on the wall, and here is an image of the king and the queen. Let's move forward. Um, everyone, this painting was in the Spanish royal collection at the time that Velasquez painted it. This, this painting, um, called the Arnolfini portrait, is actually in the, in the National Gallery in London now. But at the time it was in uh, uh, the Spanish royal collection in Madrid. And the reason for showing you this is because of the mirror in the middle of the painting. And the mirror is used to create the same type of spatial effect that we see in Velasquez's painting. So Velasquez would have known this painting very well. And again, this is one of the highlights of the National Gallery in London. So we can see the king and the queen here in the mirror. So that's why all of these people are reacting to the entrance of the king and queen where the viewer is standing. But again, art historians can't decide is whether that's really happening. But one thing that it does give you is that when you stand in front of the painting in Madrid, you really feel like you're part of the action. All of these people are reacting to your presence. So the maids themselves are curtsying. Um, the, the lady here, she's, she's giving you her attention. The painter is looking at you uh, with an enthusiastic look on his face. Uh, and we can see the perspective lines create a type of X shape in the painting. And so what you're looking at is a very complicated series of spatial relationships, uh, which if you stand 10, 12 feet away from the painting, a little bit further, is incredible but then as you get closer you can start to see the beautiful details and let's take a look at some of these so the way the dress is painted here is brilliant but as you get closer it's almost a kind of very expressive brush stroke it's, it's sort of almost like an abstract style but you have to stand further away for it to become a uh, a real uh, coherent image to, to stare at. Um, this painting uh, su has suffered some damage, unfortunately. Let's move a couple of... We see the princess close up here. Her left cheek was badly damaged. Um, not herself as, as a child, but the painting was damaged in fire that occurred at the Royal Palace in Madrid in uh, Christmas Eve, 1734, actually. 
And what had happened was, is that the Spanish Royal Collection had around a thousand paintings in it at the time. Um, it was called the Alcazar, the, uh, the former fortress palace. And it basically completely burnt down in two days. Because this painting was loved so much, it was one of the first ones to be saved. Now the windows of the former palace were quite small. And many of the paintings are up on sort of like a higher level because the rooms were all like sort of 20 foot, 30 foot ceilings. There was no attempt to make, uh, uh, to spare them. But this painting was basically ripped out of its frame and rolled up and thrown out the window into the courtyard. Uh, but there was some damage, but the restorers have done a, a great job because it's, uh, it's imperceptible today. Um, but many of his paintings got lost in this fire. So it was, uh, it was a terrible blow. Let's go, let's go, let's back up a second. Um, this is the artist's studio though that we're looking at, this room. And the king and the queen would have had to have walked through the artist's studio to get to their sleeping quarters. So is, for example, uh, this man here, Nieto, is he leading the way uh, for the king and the queen to go to their uh, rooms? Quite possibly. Uh, in fact, another thing that we can look at is why are the king and the queen blurred there? Because this is a mirror. So I don't suppose there's any physical imperfection with the mirror itself. The truth is that because he was such a brilliant painter, um, as the king got older, he didn't like the fact that Velasquez was painting his uh, aging face with such incredible honesty. And so it could well be that he actually asked him uh, to create a blur effect. Um, we're looking here at his second wife, who was 30 years younger than him. Uh, so she was only 14 when uh, she married him, which must have been a deeply traumatic experience, I suppose. And to rub salt in the wound, she was originally betrothed to his son, who was about, I think, about five years older than her at the time. Uh, but he died whilst she was over in Madrid. And so Philip IV thought it would be a good idea to marry this girl instead of his deceased son, which is a pretty strange turn of events. And in fact, the princess, the five-year-old, um, she's painted by Velasquez a couple more times. She ends up becoming the Empress of Austria. She marries Leopold I and goes to... Um, uh, goes to Vienna. Thank goodness she didn't take this painting because she took several others with her. So there are paintings by Velasquez today which are in uh, the old museum in Vienna and we'll get onto one of those a little later. Um, okay, let's, let's move on. Everybody, this is an image um, of the princess when she was about eight years old, uh, eight or nine, and this, is, this painting is in Vienna. Uh, so this is in um, the old museum. Uh, she died at 21. She was hated by the, uh, by the courtiers in, in, in Vienna. So she had a pretty miserable time there. Okay, let's go back to the big image of the painting again. Um, everybody, it's, uh, it, it's a fairly strange discussion. Uh, to talk about what people think about being the best painting in the world. Um, the former magazine, the London Illustrated News, uh, held a poll in 1985, and this painting came out on top. It was voted the best painting in the world by hundreds of different artists, readers, and uh, museum staff, etc. So that says an awful lot for it. I th it's pretty hard to argue against it. Um, if you, and I highly recommend that you do go to the Prado Museum to go and see this. It's in room number 12 at the Prado, by the way, which is a very, it's a very good choice of room uh, for the picture to be in because it's a sort of oval shape and there, uh, it allows you quite a lot of room. So if you get first in at the museum or last out, it's quite an experience to stand in front of this painting by yourself. Um, and of all paintings I've ever seen, um, there's only one other where the, a representation like this that I'm showing you 
gives you virtually nothing to what the real experience of being in front of the painting is like. The only other one which is like it is the last supper by Leonardo da Vinci in Milan. Because you genuinely feel that you're part of the action when you're standing there in front of this picture. I mean, these people are uh, essentially involving you in what they're doing. And in that sense, there's almost no other picture in art history which is like it. Um, there are loads of paintings where uh, the people in the pictures are staring at you. Uh, there are lots of pictures where the action is a lot closer, so you can see what's going on. But there's no other paintings where um, the use, the clever use of the mirror creates this um, sensation where the, you are in the position of the king. You are standing in the uh, where the king is um and that is it's uh, it's amazing uh, interest for people still today who uh, uh flood into the gallery to see this um, uh, wonderful picture um it had a huge influence on other artists um who went to the prado after it opened because as i said right at the beginning very few people even knew who diego velasquez was now, an example of someone that went, and we know this because he wrote journals about it, is the wonderful 19th century French artist, Edouard Manet. And in 1865, a new train service started from Paris to Madrid. It was like a day and a half journey. And Manet hated it. He hated Madrid. He hated the journey, hated the hotel, hated Spanish food, and wrote all about how terrible it was. Except when he saw this uh, painting and all the other Velasquez paintings in the Prado and sort of wrote back, to, he had a painter friend called um, Henri Fantana Tour and essentially said, uh, this wonderful painter with his truth and honesty and compared to him, all of the other paintings in this museum are basically fakers, but um, people have always, appreciated that Velasquez has painted um, uh, servants, ordinary people, with exactly the same degree of honesty and vitality as he's painted the royal people. And that may be one of the reasons why the painting was saved uh, when the fire came in 1734. Um, several other, his, there's a huge painting, he, uh, the expulsion of the Moors, um, uh, almost certainly uh, burnt during that fire. We don't know for sure, but uh, several of the paintings are missing. And that's a reasonable uh, explanation for its absence. It would, it would have been a bigger panel than this. Um, but it is hard to get a, a grasp of how huge this picture is. Uh, so in other words, it was not designed to be in someone's house. It definitely was designed for a palace. Um, it was designed to be uh, on the walls of a palace or a, or a huge museum. These paintings, by the way, if you're interested on the back wall here, these are by Rubens, Peter Paul Rubens, the Flemish artist who visited uh, the Spanish royal family in the 1620s. At the time, Velasquez was very much in awe of him. And uh, it was Rubens that encouraged uh, Velasquez to go to Rome. Uh, so uh, he very much enjoyed his time at Rome and didn't really want to come back. He held quite a senior position in the Spanish court. He wasn't just a painter, he was a courtier. He was, became the Chamberlain, in fact, later in life, and ended up not really painting that many pictures. He only painted 120 pictures in his whole career. Um, and that compared with his contemporary Rembrandt, his nothing like that. Rembrandt got through sort of three, four hundred paintings and hundreds of drawings, uh, hundreds of etchings. Velasquez didn't leave behind uh, anything more than 120 paintings. Um, there's a sense possibly that he was frustrated by his court role. Uh, he enjoyed the, I suppose, the easy access to, um, to models, materials, and could paint if he wanted to. But many books that have been written about him suggest that, um, there's, an, that there's an element of frustration, particularly in the um, 
final years of his life. And this painting could well be a thank you gift to the king. Um, and the thank you is for this, the Order of Santiago, where he's finally given the, um, uh, the noble title. Um, and so the painting could be a, a sort of gift to the king. Uh, Velasquez dies in 1660. He's 61 years old when he dies. And his biographer, a man called Antonio Palomino, uh, says that he dies of tertian fever, which my understanding of that is it's a sort of um, uh, attack of malaria, which can kill you within a, a couple of days if it's a severe one. Um, it's really strange for us to consider that, of course, malaria was only really wiped out in Spain at the beginning of the 1960s. And so it would have been a real killer back in his day. So uh, he went ill in the middle of um, the end of July, I think, 31st of July. And then a couple of days later, he was dead. Um, and so that was the life of uh, the amazing painter Diego Velasquez. Um, do I think it's the best painting in the world? Yes, I do, emphatically so. I don't think there's anything else that comes close to it, actually. But that's not just my opinion. Uh, we're now going to look at this to finish off. Oh, uh, this, yeah, actually, before I finish off. This is the last portrait of the king. And you can see that, you can see the sagging eyes the worn out face, he's had a miserable time. Many of his children have died. His first wife died. He's got a much, much younger wife. Um, the son that will become the next king has got uh, multiple health problems. Um, so you can understand why the, the, the honesty uh, of Velasquez's brush is something that the king does not want to subject himself to for much longer. Everybody, this is the great Picasso. Uh, this is Picasso's version of Las Meninas. And he did 58 different studies for Las Meninas. And if you go to the uh, Picasso Museum in Barcelona, which is highly recommended, they've got the entire suite of sketches and uh, preparations uh, for this picture, which was from 1957, highly recommended. Picasso uh, went to the Prado dozens of times to study this picture um, and, and finally decided that he would actually do his own version of the painting. So this is an example of a great artist in his own right who was hugely influenced by it. And that, everybody, I hope you've enjoyed it, concludes my talk on the great painting. Please feel free to switch your microphones on and say hi. Any questions? This thing that is on the left-hand side, that's presumably an easel, is it? Looks like it, a is giant e it looks like a giant easel, is it? Yeah, that says easel. Let's go back and explain that a bit. I didn't explain that. I thought All it right. was a door at first, but definitely it is an easel, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, this, this he, is, he is painting here. You can see he's got a brush in his hand. Mm. So he's actually painting. Uh, let's go to the, yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. Mm. You, you can see the brush in his hand and th this is his palette. So he's got his, his paints are there. So he is in the middle of painting the royal family. Oh, okay. uh, some people, some people think that the princess is having to be persuaded to move back to where her parents are because in fact Velasquez is painting the king and the queen so they're posing for a portrait and the princess has wandered away from her parents in a strop and the bridesmaids are tr tr trying to convince her to return some people think that um, but yeah this is a huge this is a huge uh, picture for him you wonder, so how he paints, you wonder how he paints the top of the picture, don't you? Because he... Uh, step, ladder step, ladder. step ladder. Is it step ladder? Yeah, 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 something like a step ladder. Mm. 
we go. Amazing. <clears throat> Anybody else? Thank you, Simon. You're welcome. <laughs> I have one question. The picture he based the mirror on, is that one from uh, Jan van Eyck? Yes, this is Jan van Eyck. Um, this portrait, uh, this is called the Arnold Feeney portrait. Yeah. And it's in the National Gallery in London. Um, and the reason why it's in the National Gallery is that um, it was also taken by Joseph Bonaparte. Um, and it was captured by the Duke of Wellington at the Battle of Victoria in 1813. And the picture was brought back to London. Um, it, it, it was in a slightly precarious state. This picture was dates from 1434, so it's much older. Um, uh, and I think, I think this is, I think we're incredibly lucky to have this picture in London. I really do. Um, yeah, it's I, been, I never saw the mirror. It's phenomenal. Yeah, let's let's take a look at the mirror. Let's see, look at that. It's really clever. So uh, this should be the subject of a different talk. Um, I know this picture well. These are oranges here. This makes this makes the uh, a very kind of wealthy guy because it would be been very expensive to imported oranges to the north of Europe uh, six seven hundred years ago. Uh, but Velasquez would have known this picture for sure. Yeah, great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Very good, enjoyed it, lovely. Everybody, next week's talk um, is another Spanish picture. We're gonna be looking at Guernica by Picasso. Great. Okay, so it's Guernica by Picasso next week. So we're going to go into a totally different, for something completely different. <laughs> awesome. Thank, Thank you, Simon. Simon. You're welcome, everybody. You're welcome. Simon. Nice